Hi, I'm Tom Woods, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and today we are going to talk about history. And I am excited to have our special guest on today because he's the first person in a long time who has made history, well, the name of his podcast is History Comes Alive, and actually that's kind of what I, how I was going to describe it. So, Jeff, you have a perfect name for your podcast. Jeff Nichols is with us. He's an armchair historian who enjoys the big picture application of historical events far more than just the chronological names and dates often associated with them. He envisions the narrative of history as just that, a true life narrative. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Doug. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So we've been talking for a little while because I know you through some other relationships and stuff. And I know that this podcast, which is relatively new, has been sort of in the works in some fashion in your mind for at least a decade. And I know that we have a mutual friend who's encouraged you to you know, produce these things because you provide this narrative, this understanding and explanation of history that sort of, at least to me, seems not politically driven or agenda driven, but it sort of resembles, hey, here's what's happening in this part of the world and in this part of the world and in this part of the world. And here's how they sort of are happening concurrently and how they're working together. And that sort of sets the stage for things like understanding the American founding. So I'm really excited to promote your podcast because right now, especially in 2020, but even you know in the last couple decades, it's been pretty clear that a lot of people have a little bit of a reticence to trust the sources when they say, oh, here's what happened in history and here's why it was bad or here's why it was good. And you don't take that approach. So anyway, I, I want to I talk a little bit about your podcast to sort of introduce people why you're doing it. So I'm going to give you an opportunity here to be like, hey, why History Comes Alive with Jeff Nichols? What are you trying to do here? Well, I personally, I just try to understand history myself so that I can make better decisions. When uh, when I was younger, I didn't always make good decisions. And, you know, after a while, you get sick of uh, running into brick walls. I, I wasn't uh, necessarily a conscientious student. Uh, I got decent grades, but I, I always gravitated towards history and literature. So I didn't like English class. Uh, but when it came to great literature, I loved it. And, and I think the reason why for me was I, I've... I've always seen in my head, uh, whether it's, it's, again, you know, real history narratives or, or even great literature, um, I always see the narrative running in my head like a movie. Mm. And it excites me, you know, and I, I think about it from different points of view. So, you know, the narrative may be of a heroic military leader, but my mind always wanders as I listen to their exploits. I'm always thinking about the people they fought too, like, well, what did they think? And where did they come from? And and, and why did they do that? And, and what I found as I got older was, um, as I read more, was that there's always a backstory. And the, the interesting thing about understanding history, it, it's not the memorization of names and dates. It's knowing the backstory, you know, and really kind of filling in the blanks and coming to an understanding of why this happened. Mm -hmm. And so for myself, the more I did that, the better my decisions became you know, frankly, the better quality life I had, I, I didn't get in as much trouble. But then I noticed too, that I don't panic as much anymore. Well, I didn't ever panic, but I don't get ruffled. You know, we're in a, a hostile kind of political environment right now. And, you know, I've read enough history. I hope our government doesn't fall, but, you know, governments and peoples and nations have come and gone throughout history. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a certain perspective that comes with that. There's certain trends that you see, there's certain things, certain language that's used. And the more you read history, the more at peace you can be knowing that, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm a spectator. So when I do my history podcast, um, I'm not just a spectator. Now I become an announcer and I'm, I'm really trying to, you know, narrate history that way. It's a very exciting thing what's happening on the field today, folks. And, and this is what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the historical context. So I've listened to, I haven't finished every episode that you've released so far. 
but I've listened to, the, of the episodes that I've listened to, you seem to be setting the stage for the founding of American history. And, you know, when I thought of, when, I, when you told me, hey, my podcast is now up, I'm like, all right, great. I'm going to start in 1776 because that's where Ron Swanson told me history began, yeah. you know, and everything else before that was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that line. Oh, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> that's just such a classic line, right? And it's like, oh, no, wait, there's more to it. And honestly, it answers a lot of questions. Basically, you start, and I'll let you explain where you start, but you start way before the American founding with the peoples and the people groups that that were here during, you know, the American Revolution and what they, what their life and culture was like. And honestly, it's a breath of fresh air to sort of spend some time in that sort of prehistory, if you will. I mean, it's obviously part of its own history, but pre-American history in a way, because now I have a sense of understanding who they were from from a high level, high altitude, right. you know, kind of perspective. So how far back do you begin before the American founding? I actually started in 1485, and I'm not sure if you're to that episode yet. I think it's episode uh, five. What I do, there's a couple of ways I look at history and how I presented this. The first one is uh, when I was younger, we actually had, you know, hardcover encyclopedias. Um, I know some people find that hard to believe. Mm. But, um, you know, we. My dad, my dad still has one in his office. Yeah, it's funny how. That I looked at when I was a kid. Yeah, aren't they great? It's funny how antiquated they get. But um, mm-hmm. when I was growing up, you know, our set was from like 1968. And as a young child, I loved the anatomy page. So there was these, you know, the clear transparencies. And you start out with like the human skeleton. And then the next transparency is the circular sy- circulatory system. And then it was the the muscles. And by the time you're done with like six six of these transparency pages, you all you see is a human being staring back at you, you know, fully skinned. Mm-hmm. And I always loved the way that built. I found it interesting. And so as I've approached the the founding of America in much the same way, I, I've had these transparencies, and each one of these layers can be taken off and and looked at and observed for itself, but then they they made a larger storyline. So what I did was, y- you're right, the standard practice is to start either with Jamestown or uh, Plymouth Rock. If you want to get really fancy, you'll back up to Roanoke and, you know, you can have some fun with that. And then we very quickly, you know, the timeline moves ra- rather rapidly to 1776. But these people... Part of the reason we do that, I think, is that we so desperately want to think of the colonial Americans as like our little brothers and sisters in the culture, right? Or or maybe they're our big brothers and sisters. And the reality is they had a very different view of the world. Um, they were far more medieval than we like to think. Mm. And I know when I was growing up, you know, there was a cutoff there. Like you did European history in, I think, fifth grade and then, you know, U.S. history in sixth grade, and ne'er the twain shall meet. But the folks that came over from Europe, they had different prerogatives. And so when I started thinking about doing this podcast, um, and you're right, it's been you know 20 years in the making, or close to it. Uh, when I started thinking about the podcast, I, I really, the goal was to start maybe in the French and Indian War, uh, which really set the generation of our founders up, um, where they became into prominence. But then you start backing up. It's like, okay, so what started the French and Indian War? And there's things that precipitated that. And then what what precipitated those things? And so by the time I was done, I found myself back in Europe. And you can't really ignore um, the you know the the pilgrims were in the Netherlands. Uh, they were no longer uh, happy in England. They couldn't really live in England. So they actually spent about ten years in uh, Leiden. And when you start knowing that, like, so what's the backdrop of the pilgrims being in the Netherlands? And so I, I figured out that they, they didn't get along well in England. They were separatists. But then how is it that they had the safety net in the Netherlands? And so you start unraveling like all of Europe. The Netherlands had just gained their independence from Spain. They weren't officially independent, but they were living independently. And so all of this European history starts to just you know, fall down like dominoes. And to really understand then American history, the the founding of the country, you need to understand Europe was going through the Reformation. 
It was just after the Reformation. And you had the emergence of the modern nation state, which it didn't exist. You know, in the 1500s, the modern nation state didn't exist. It was just starting to emerge. And so these things led to American colonialization. And so you really can't ignore Europe. And then there's so much going on. Like I started with uh, the Dutch. They were escaping the Spanish. You know, the Spanish had the largest empire uh, since Rome. So I don't think we give enough credit to what Spain actually accomplished. And there's this little sliver, this first series, uh, this little sliver of land in the Netherlands that is a very small piece of property uh, that was basically owned by the Spanish, and they were fighting for their independence. And they have Spanish France on one side, and they have Spanish German states basically on the other, and they're owned by Spain. And they begin to fight for their, the, the Protestant Reformation occurs. They start looking for their independence. And lo and behold, across the channel, uh, Henry, through not because of religious regions, but uh, England breaks from the Catholic Church. And so they kind of have this, this relationship with the Netherlands. And the Huguenots, uh, French Protestants, they're starting to have some real power and some real clout in France. And so all of these countries are undergoing this reformation from different angles and different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And, and they're all fighting each other. And, you know, it used to be that it was span, it was Catholic Europe, right? And so everybody was subservient to Rome, to the Pope. And, you know, the politics was kind of controlled by that. But as these nation states emerge and as they they started to trade around the world, Spain has a global empire that's emerging. They're getting rich. Other people see that. And so you're starting to kind of look at the, the emergence of a nation state where people are start, starting to want to amass their own wealth. And trade with Asia really was coming through the Mediterranean at the time. So when the Spanish, when they go across the Atlantic and they start trading in Asia, Everybody starts wanting to make money. They start abandoning this, this Mediterranean route. They're all looking for like the Northwest Passage. So this is where all of this controversy starts to come in between Catholics and Protestants. But then more importantly, what emerges is the nation state. So Frenchmen all of a sudden become very interested in the advancement of French things. And, you know, Spanish people want Spanish things. And mm. and. So when they come across the Atlantic, then uh, the English colonials, uh, Spain's already been here, the Dutch have been here, the French have been here, England's kind of late to the game. And what happens is they transferred all of those antagonisms, the religious wars, we're going to talk about that when we, we come across the Atlantic. There were a lot, of, a lot of conflict in New England that we learn very little about in American schools, but they were just a transfer. The the folks that lived back then, the the Englishmen in New England and the French from Canada, they saw those as extensions of religious wars in Europe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so I I have a question about the <laughs> the Protestant Catholic divide. So I'm you know what what I think of when I think of like the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic and what you fight about. It's about salvation and justification by faith or works or whatever. But like it had to have been more than that for them to like be literally territorial over things. So like, what was it that the Protestants and the Catholics like had against each other other than like, was it really just about theological disputes or was it, was it more than that? I think it was about theological disputes primarily because, you know, the Reformation changed a lot of things that, you know, we'll never know exactly what it was to be in the mind of one of those guys one of those guys, meaning anybody in Europe and say, you know, 1519, because we, we don't, we didn't grow up in the environment that they did, Mm -hmm. but the Catholic church basically, um, controlled everything. And, you know, it was an interesting thing. And I don't cover this in the podcast. This would be another series. This is one of those side ventures I'd like to do. But, you know, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis, the Catholic Church was pretty divided. A, a good portion of their of their priests they agreed with him. You know, it was really over the indulgences, uh, basically with Tetzel. Um, So, the Catholic Church controlled everything. They had a lot of power, and they had a lot of influence over the monarchies. Uh, 
And so when Luther nailed his 95 thesis, you know, the idea was that he wanted to reform the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of money involved. And like with any religion, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Catholic basher. I'm not a Protestant basher. I'm not, you know, I, I just like to look at the sterile facts of the history in a lot of ways. Although I do have theological views. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Sure. But, you know, it's hard to wrap your brain around a lot of these guys. I mean, they were very loosey-goosey with their religious affiliations. And, you know, Henry was a, a, a stalwart for the Catholic Church until they wouldn't give him an annulment. And then he leaves the Catholic Church confiscates their property, kills their priests. I mean, he's an Anglican. Ta-da! Yeah, right. So a lot of these guys, um, William of Orange uh, was another one. He's the Dutch champion, you know. Um, this guy's all over the boards. He's Lutheran, he's Protestant, he's Catholic. So it does come down, a lot of it, to justification. There was a uh, an issue in France, as an example, where the Protestants started to hang placards. It's called the Placard Affair. They started to hang placards around Paris that were insulting uh, the Catholic perspective on justification. And the French didn't take too kindly to that. They were still predominantly Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it really does come down. Part of it is the Catholic Church is in control. People want to maintain their power base and their money. And yeah, it, it, it really was, I think, in a lot of ways, that simple at first. Mm. Um, that it was about justification um, and the communion table, transubstantiation. But then, you know, it's interesting. It's a great question, actually, because 100 years later in the 30 years war, that started out to be a religious war. You know, that kind of was the defining marker. Started out to be a religious war. The Catholics basically were going to just wipe out Protestantism. But at the end of the day, uh, France, who was, you know, consistently more and more uncomfortable with the power and dominance that Spain had. Spain at the time, not only was Spain that we know, but they also controlled the German states. So France is a power of its powerhouse of its own, but they are surrounded by Spanish, the Spanish Empire. So at the end of the Thirty Years' War, France, because they were uncomfortable with, with the power that the Spanish Catholics had, they actually sided with the Swedes, who were Protestant, and they actually ended up winning that war. So that war became more about national territory and money than it did religion. But it, it really was that defined at first. It, it wow. came down to how you're justified. Yeah, I guess it makes me appreciate the fights that we have today. At least they're not <laughs> so violent. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So you were, I, I kind of took us on a sideshow there about the Catholic-Protestant divide, partly because you didn't specifically cover it in the podcast and I wanted to know. And second, because it's just kind of curious to me. But we were talking about setting the stage for like the American founding. You start in the late 1400s and, uh, or in the 1400s, I forget what you just said. And so you're saying that European history and American history are, I mean, obviously no one's going to disagree with you, but like they're, they're actually more connected than, than most people kind of mentally think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so I start, at, I think it's episode five. Uh, I back up to 1485. And what I did with the first episode, um, I introduced the cast of characters in the new world, mm -hmm. uh, the Dutch, the French, Spanish. Yep, yep. And then again, we looked at the Netherlands. Uh, we took a look at what was going on in France. We we took another look at the at the Dutch and how they emerged as a global powerhouse, which again we don't we don't hear much about. But then, because it's the English colonial Americans that we were interested in, I took a look at England and I I kind of tied all of these things together. and And the way it happened was Henry the Seventh, who was Henry the Eighth's father. He assumed the throne in 1485. And at that time, again, the, the idea of the, of the nation state as we know it didn't exist. So there was no such thing as a national military or a national navy. Um, but there was a lot of danger in the world. And so he did inherit a family navy. And what he did was he started recognizing, basically, I'll, I'll paraphrase, and, and obviously this is several hours on the podcast, but basically, Henry VII realized it's a dangerous world, and I live on an island. So if I want to be protected from continental wars, and if I want to be protected from invasion, 
it's really a matter of preventing people from actually getting to my island. And so this sets in motion a lot of European history and it ties a lot of things together. The first thing, you know, England annexed Wales, right? So let's own our neighbor and then they can't be a threat to us. They went after Ireland much the same way. That would be a long time coming. But the big problem was Scotland because they were Catholic. But Henry starts building this national navy. And then when he passes from the scene, he's a very shrewd administrator. He left England in good shape financially with the nucleus of what would become a national navy. And Henry VIII, he recognizes the value in that. And he also he has some tension with France. And so Henry VIII kind of expands the idea, builds more ships, gets very creative, you know, builds different kinds of ships and begins to recognize he's now isolating himself. And actually um, there was conflict with France. And even though France kind of came away the victor, Henry actually was able to stall off an invasion. So he found out, the English found out very early on uh, in the 1500s that their navy could protect their national interest. So the rest of the continent is still, you know, they're embroiled in the Reformation, but they're still largely Catholic. Well, England now is Anglican, and they've got this navy that protects them from Catholic invasion. And Henry adds to that. And and along with that, now you're starting to get a generation of Englishmen that are starting to understand, you know, not just naval warfare, but navigation. They're becoming very good at at shipbuilding and at sailing. And then the baton passes ultimately to Elizabeth. She's got a couple guys that had some real experience uh, with Portuguese and Spanish shipping and trade. She's got some guys that were slave traders that have been going around the globe. And they really enhanced the English Navy. And so as the as the Reformation storms on, Elizabeth begins to fund German mercenaries um, and the German Protestant cause. She funds the Dutch Protestant cause. She funds the French Huguenots, which are Protestants. And part of that was to stave off you know, her enemies from attacking England. But the rise of that English nation state really pushes a lot of people over the edge. And, you know, Paying attention to that, realizing that that's the real thrust for English naval dominance Mm -hmm. and seafaring, this is why they were able to come over and colonize. And this is why they that ended up ultimately to be their success was naval superiority. They might not have a lot of folks on the island. Uh, They didn't have a big population. They were isolated, but they could go anywhere in the world and destroy everybody else's boats, basically. Mm. And that's what brought them to North America. And that's what brought them a lot of that success was just the navigational skill and the prevention of actually being able to invade England and take over. So hopefully that answers your question. I think it's in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, I have this feeling of getting this impression that if we sat down and had coffee or drinks or something, I could ask you a question about anything in the last 300 years and you could talk for 20 minutes about it. <laughs> <laughs> Some things, maybe. <laughs> well, you would just go with, you know, here's what I know, and you'd still have 20 minutes worth of content. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, yeah, I mean, it obviously it takes a long time to sort of develop that knowledge and stuff. But yeah, I mean, those kind of precipitating events, and, and not they're not even like events in the same way that like an assassination started a world war, but they are events in like the lives of people who are in charge and in power and who are, you know, obviously notable from the side of history. And so once we get to this side of the Atlantic, you know, one one thing that I've often wondered about the about the first people who were over here in America is like, did they think of themselves as New World people? Did they think of themselves as, you know, European? How did they sort of self-identify to use, you know, language of now? Yeah, that, you know, that's a very um a very good question because they thought of themselves as Europeans. You know, the the Dutch, the French, and the Spanish had a very hard time getting permanent colonists. Life was pretty good over there, you know? Um, when I was growing up, I think, it, I don't know if it's the public education, the people I hung around, but I always had like an anti-French uh, view, you know? Oh, it's the French, you know, we're English colonials. Well, yeah, a couple hundred years ago we were, 
But the reality is, you know, if I had to go back in time, life was pretty good in France and it was pretty good in the Netherlands and Spain was the dominant world power. So the folks that came over from those countries, it took a long time to get any sense of permanence. Like they would come over, they might be in the military or they might be, you know, looking for wealth, but they would come over and then they'd go home, you know? So they never lost that European flavor. And that's something I really didn't know. Why are they coming for just us? I mean, why leave and go back? Is it just like vacation or like, well, not really vacation, but like, is it just like, hey, I'm going to go explore something new for a few years and then head back or what? Yeah, money. Uh, they wanted money. You know, they knew there was a lot of wealth to be made. And part of that, you know, it started out, they wanted the Asian trade, right? So they wanted to get over to Asia and they didn't want to go the Mediterranean route. I mean, that route was taken. So, Getting to Asia was great, but along the way, you know, Spain found Central and South America, and there's a lot of gold. And, you know, so they start bringing that gold back and it starts filling the coffers. And so everybody's looking for the big hit, right? It's like, you know, 1849 California. And so a lot of it, they were adventurers and they wanted to make a lot of money. You know, you've got to remember in Europe at this time, it's almost like the caste system, right? So there's not a lot of opportunity to make money. There's not a lot of available land. You know, one of the things I, I may work into a future podcast that I find interesting was the power that the guilds had. You know, I know I'll probably get people that hate me for saying this or say I misquoted or talked out of line, but basically the trade unions. Yeah. They... As a perfect example, um, and this is from England, but the continent wasn't a whole lot different. There were uh, either 19 or 21. I want. I think I had 19 written down. I heard it was 21 the other day. I think there were 21 different guilds that were involved in building a gun in England. <laughs> so, you know, you specialized. You could only do one thing. And there was actually a court case on record in London where they hauled this guy in that could do everything. You could make the whole gun. They didn't believe that one person could do that. But when you come to the new world, like an English colonial, you had a gunsmith. He did everything. And the point to that is they came over here to make their fortune and they could do things in the new world, kind of unwatched and unsupervised. They would never have gotten away with in Europe. And so the chance for adventure and the opportunity to make money that would never have presented itself yeah. if they stayed home, that drew a lot of people, you know? And at the same time, life's pretty good. So a lot of people said, why would I risk crossing the ocean, getting scurvy or some other disease and dying in some godforsaken place? I mean, I'm, I'm not risking it. Yeah. So when I started recognizing how much I loved American history, was about the same time that it dawned on me, like, okay, well then why did the English pour over here? Because then the next question is, life must not have been as good in England as it was everywhere else. Life was tough in England, you know? And that's what I grew up hearing. Yeah. And so it was not only tough in England, but, you know, and again, it takes like 10 hours on this, on the podcast series, yeah, this sure. opening series. But the reality is England spent most of the 1500s securing national security against basically Catholic Europe. Well, once that threat, that major threat subsided after the Spanish Armada, once that subsided, they started looking internally. And, you know, England was an Anglican country. They're not Protestant, you know, they're Anglican and they're somewhere between Catholicism and Protestantism. And the power base in England generally was Anglican, but there's a lot of Protestants, Puritans, a lot of Calvinists. Uh, Calvin and Zwingli from Geneva had a lot of influence. When, when the Catholics would take over England, a lot of the Protestants would, would flow into Geneva. And then when the Catholics lost power, they'd come back. So mm. they'd come back all amped up for Protestantism. Well, once the Catholic threat was gone, then the Anglicans and the Protestants, they figured out they didn't really agree on a lot of things. So it got very uncomfortable in England. It was a, a tough environment, but they really kind of had like their own little reformation. And I, I know people will scald me for that too, but that's kind of what happened was the Anglicans had ultimate power. And so the Protestants, you know, some of them were separatists, like the pilgrims. The pilgrims said, there's no reforming the Anglican church. We can't live with you people. 
they left. But the, the Protestants in England, the Puritans, they stayed. They wanted to reform the Anglican church. And once they figured out that the Anglican church didn't want to be reformed, then it got really uncomfortable. And it did lead, you know, that's partially why they had an English civil war. Uh, the Stuarts were a terrible monarchical line. I mean, they followed maybe the greatest monarch England had ever had in Elizabeth for what she accomplished. And then these guys just, it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. And so the Protestants figured out that they couldn't stay in England. And so the, the conditions were bad to begin with. And now on top of it, you've got more religious persecution. That's what they're starting to face, basically. So they came over to the new world in droves. They didn't come over here for a temporary stay. They didn't come over here to make their fortune and go home. They came over here to stay. They never wanted to go back to England, but they, they still thought of themselves as English. And it's interesting with the 13 colonies, you've got Catholic colonies, Puritan colonies, Quaker colonies, Anglican colonies. They all had their own flavor, but one, one distinct unifying thing was they all still thought of themselves as English. They just wanted to be their own kind of Englishmen. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a weird thing, but yeah, the Europeans that came over for generations, they thought of themselves as Europeans. So we could talk about this for a very long time, obviously, and I know that there's this impulse to just, and maybe you, you can tease this, but not give us full solid answer because, you know, I want people to listen to your podcast, but I can imagine, and I kind of want to know this too, because I've been listening to your podcast and now I've got you on the air and I want to know why was America really founded? <laughs> yeah. And and it's not a, it's not a one minute answer, is it? <laughs> no, it's a, uh, that's a long answer. Um, it How really, many hours in your podcast will that become? <laughs> oh, that'll be, it might actually be just about the rest of it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It was founded for liberty, uh, freedom, and money, basically. It's always money. But here's the the sticky part of that answer is, it depends on whose liberty, freedom, and money you're talking about. Mm. You know, they came over here because a lot of them came over, they felt persecuted or to make their fortune. But once they got here, there was a lot of money to be made. And I don't know if I said it in any of the podcast episodes yet. I think I might have. But, you know, to me, that first couple of generations, they may have been the freest people to ever live the earth, mm. like in thousands of years, because they came over here, you know, with virtually no oversight from their sending governments. And unfortunately, you know, the Native Americans, the people that were here, I mean, they got wiped out by disease far more than warfare. They didn't stand really a chance in a lot of ways. So America was founded for liberty and freedom, um, the ability to make money. But again, it depends on, on whose perspective you're talking. Mm -hmm. So when I imagine teaching something like history, you know, when I grew up, it was history textbook. The transparencies you described from the encyclopedia were used in these overhead transparencies in the front of the classroom you know, a la pre-PowerPoint-esque stuff. And so I remember I remember uh, overhead projectors as a kid. But I remember lots of visuals. We would have a map on the wall. We would have maps in our textbooks and things like that. And it would seem kind of difficult to me to listen to history unless I've already kind of know the geography to some extent. And for that matter, to even understand, I mean, you have to have a mental idea of, of the timeline. Now, you said names and dates aren't super important insofar as you don't need to know like very, very specific dates most of the time. So I'm guessing decades or parts of a century, you know, kind of suffice for the, you know, the introduction. But how do you overcome only being an auditory experience for your listeners? Yeah, you know, I came up with an idea kind of on, on the spur of the moment, I was recording something about a year ago and I started thinking about it in terms of like a clock face, you know? And so now this is kind of my goal, like one of my shticks. Um, if I'm known as the clock face guy, that'll be great. Um, <laughs> because, you know, one of the things that bugs me about the current political system or, or the, the environment, I guess, the atmosphere in America is, you know, we always want to play gotcha. And, I'd like to think I've grown above that. I, I hate that game. 
And I, I think, first of all, let me back up. I don't really have a political home. I, I'm a nomad. So um, I'm really an issues guy. And that being said, one of the things that drives me nuts, you know, every six months or so, you see some national public figure, usually a politician, um, doing a press conference. And they might be talking about some area of the world. And some 23-year-old reporter stands up and says, well, do you know where Tajikistan is? And you know, this 23-year-old snot looked it up just before they asked the question. And they try to get people to be uncomfortable because they don't know geography. So my knee jerk is, well, I don't think the guy needs to know geography to make a good decision. So that kind of unnerves me. But in the same token, I think I'm pretty good at geography, but don't ask me where Tajikistan is. I actually do know where that is, but don't ask me where some of these places are. I thought that was a made up place that you just said to make sure that it just kind of represented every place. So there is a, to, what did well, you, what's the it's, name? There's a couple of Istans over, you know, over there. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was kind of a made up name, but the point is I know where some of those Istans are. And that's a great question, Doug. You can edit that, Chris, um, or you can keep it. <laughs> no, no, um, no, he's going to keep it in. <laughs> uh, so the point though is I know where some of these like obscure places are. But don't, I don't want to be asked that question. And I've learned, I don't assume that someone knows that, you know, like I've stopped saying like, well, you know, saying some quote that I think is very popular. I've stopped assuming everybody knows it. So what I did was I started thinking about this first series. You know, how would you describe the geography? Because unless you just got out of like middle school, I think it's middle school, you really probably haven't looked at a European map in a while unless you've gone on vacation. So what I did was I look at each one of my series is going to have a different graphic. And this first one was, it's a clock face and you know, it's got North, South, East and West on it. But France is really the epicenter of the, of the series. And if you know where France is on my clock face, yeah. and I, I do this on the, on the podcast, France is kind of like the 10 and a half down to about the seven. And it kind of takes up like, I don't know, 40% of the clock face. That's France. And then there's that little sliver from like 10 and a half or 11 up to midnight. And it, it's this little triangle and it doesn't quite come down to the middle of the clock face. That's the Netherlands. And then Germany is like 12 to three. And just off the clock face, you know, about the 10 is England. And just off the clock face about the seven is Spain. And so I'm going to try to set the series up. We've got graphics for the next series. Connecticut will be the, the ground zero, but I'm going to try to introduce each series, not only by explaining the clock face, but also having that graphic. So like if you go to, you know, Libsyn, or if you go to the website and you pull the podcast up, you'll see the graphic there that will at least show you kind of looking through a microscope and, a, you know, a Petri dish or a slide, it will at least show you kind of an overhead of that geography of where mm -hmm. guys are located. Yeah, that's pretty clever. I mean, obviously, I set you up. I already knew that because I was very taken by it. And I'm like, all right, this is great. Because that's a really, it's a hurdle for a lot of people. And it's to visualize what's going on where you need to know that. And to some extent, I mean, would you agree that to some extent, you don't quite need to know where on a map things are as long as you can sort of say the Netherlands is not France, is not England, and they're, and that England is separated by water? I mean, is that, I mean, if I only knew that, would that be enough? I think it would be, but the visual does help. Yeah. You know, it was really shrewd of the Henrys to recognize like, hey, I mean, the world's dangerous and we live on an island. If we build big <laughs> boats, no one can get us. I mean, no one, no one thought of that before, you know? And, yeah. and the idea of, you know, warfare, naval warfare back then was grappling, right? So you basically, you take your army from land, you put them on a big boat with a bunch of guys that know how to sail. And then you grapple, right? You, you, you might have some cannons, but you pull up alongside the other guy's boat and you hope that your army can beat their army up in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what happens. And the English said, you know, we have a smaller population. So if we not only build boats and they can't get to us, if our boats go faster and they can't catch us, then they can't even board us to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat fights. We can just blow them up from a distance. That's what they did. So... I would agree that you don't necessarily have to know the specifics, but like in this particular case, it yeah. is an interesting thing to have an overview to realize like that was slick for Henry to realize that. Like if you can't come yeah. over here, you can't get me. 
So, okay, one more question then. And this is more like I could have asked you this at any point or at the beginning or whatever. If you're at a cocktail party and you want to impress somebody with something really engaging and you want them to want to talk to you for the rest of the night, what what sort of historical factoid do you tell them? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I'll say this because I just recorded uh, an episode that will be out Friday. Um, I think at this point, it would be bringing up the English Armada as opposed to the Spanish Armada. Mm. In uh, 1588, we're... You know, might not be familiar with the date, but in 1588 was the famous Spanish Armada. And it's always kind of intrigued me that we call it the Spanish Armada, although it was actually defeated. I don't know why they've titled it that, you know. But a year after the Spanish Armada, England launched their own armada to try and counterattack Spain. And it was an abysmal failure. And I think at this point, you know, I always try to find some of those things. Um, the one that I've used for years. Uh, which I'll probably go back to when I get bored with the English Armada, is like the Beaver Wars. They were wars that were fought, depending on who you talk to, you know, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it really helped to define economically the Northeast of the United States. Um, it involved, you know, the, the Iroquois and the Huron Indians, the Otto Indians, the French, the English, the Dutch. I mean, it, it was all hands on deck. And it played such a pivotal role in so much of the development of the Northeast and the identity of the colonies. And yet we never hear about it, you know, and, and it included a good chunk of, of Canada. And so I have some friends that are Canadian and I always just assumed, well, they must learn about it in Canadian school, right? They talk about the Beaver Wars. They don't talk about it either. So, hmm. you know, it's one of those things I like to bring up because then people will go home and Google search it and they'll be like, holy cow, there actually, there were beaver wars that he was right. Why didn't I ever hear about this? <laughs> and that's what makes history come alive. That's what makes it so exciting, you know, to realize like, I understand, you know, compulsory education. It, there's only so much you can do. There's only so much bandwidth. They should be teaching you to be patriotic and love your country. I get it. But they leave so much of that history out. And when people say they're, they don't like, I never liked history in school. Really? Well, let's talk about the Pequot Wars or the Beaver Wars. And their eyes start opening up like, what are you talking about? Let's talk about Sabra Colony in Connecticut. You know, Oliver Cromwell was going to move there. Huh? Oh, yeah, he owned land. And then the, the English Civil War came along and he got tangled up in that instead. What do you, I'd have never heard these things before. Those are the types of things I'll bring up. And usually that stirs a conversation. Uh, okay. So I was going to let that be the end of the end of it. And then you just talked about the school should be teaching about patriotism. So I want to know what you, what you think about patriotism. Uh, patriotism is a slippery word, isn't it? Um, oh, sure it is. <laughs> I, uh, one day I feel patriotic and other days I do not. <laughs> yeah. You know, what is patriotism on a parallel conversation? You know, what is, what is citizenship? What is good citizenship? You know, um, I think that if I was in, you know, Uganda or Uruguay or, you know, name a country. I mean, I try to pick things that we're not always familiar with. Angola. Um, I would be the best citizen there and I would want to know about my country. I would want to know the, the pros and cons. So for me, the idea of patriotism, it isn't all smoke and mirrors and, hey, ain't the world wonderful. The idea of patriotism is, you know, first of all, I think all things are local. I believe in the nation state. Don't misunderstand me. But I, I believe all things are local. And having a certain sense of pride and, and, you know, belonging to your local people is important. And so the world's a dangerous place. And as we recognize boundaries and borders, you know, we ought to be, it, this is, again, this is kind of off the cuff. My idea of patriotism is to appreciate where I'm at uh, to want to first and foremost advance, you know, the, the the cause of the people around me to not to do harm to other people, but to enhance the lives of the people that I have the most effect over. Mm -hmm. And so patriotism is, is being a good citizen. You know, I, again, I don't want to curtail anybody's ability to live their lives. I want to give as much freedom and liberty to as many people around me or or help them achieve that as possible. To me, that's patriotism. If I only hear good things about the country that I live in, then you never really know where your loyalties are if you've never heard the bad stuff. Mm. So for schools teaching patriotism, an appreciation of, of where we're at and who we are as a country, 
but also to appreciate, you know, where we've where we've come from. You know, we like no nation on earth. We have pivoted uh, multiple times as a nation, and this is why, you know, we we've got a currency. Granted, it's been devalued. We could have some discussions about that, but we have what is recognized as the longest running currency, I, I think, in world history. You know, there's a certain pride that comes with those things, mm-hmm. and so my idea of patriotism is just honestly assessing, you know, the historical past. Um, what worked and what didn't. And then if we're really conscientious and we really are serious about wanting the best for our neighbor, then we choose from this plurality of of events from the past and we try to implement as many of those things that yielded good benefits as possible. I think that's patriotism. Yeah, I'd go with that. That's good. So I hope that our listeners have, uh, their appetites have been whetted, that they will go and listen to your podcast, History Comes Alive. Where can they find it? And you also have a website that they can uh, find you as well. Absolutely. So on all of your social media platforms, it's uh, History with Jeff. So the website is historywithjeff.com. And, you know, from there, you can click the radio buttons for um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I'm also on um, Libsyn, so hcapodcast.libsyn.com. So the HCA is obviously History Comes Alive. And that will have all of your you know, podcasting platforms, uh, Stitcher, Apple, you name it. But those would be the places to go. And we've also got a bunch of videos. I put some out. They look mildly amateurish. They'll get better. But um, we're going to be putting out some videos. I've got a few on the YouTube channel that deal with basically my approach to history, why we study history, why I think it's important. Um, I've got a bunch of blogs on the website and we have put those to audio as well. A couple of them are a little longer, I think about 10 minutes, but um, we've got some blogs. We'll be releasing those as well on the website. So History with Jeff, you know, favorite social media platform and uh, you'll find us Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and the website. Awesome. Excellent. Well, Jeff, I appreciate you uh, joining us for another episode. Absolutely. It was great being here, Doug, and I certainly appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Thank you.